Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, so, wow, what a day, right? Uh, I kind of want to echo what other people have said. This is sort of amazing, seeing how many people are interested in WebAssembly. Like, literally five years ago, this was not a thing. So it's very, very cool to see a room full of people who are all excited and also incredibly knowledgeable about WebAssembly. Very, very cool. So um, my talk is called WebAssembly Expanding the Pi. Expanding the pie, and there's a picture of a pie. So let's talk about this, but uh, first I want to take you back to September 2015. Uh, maybe that's not going to work. All right, let's just do it this way. Nope, that's not working either. I'm using Linux, by the way. <laughs> this is all <laughs> WebAssembly. There we go. Okay, I'll just do it this way. So, taking you back to September 2015, if you remember, Straight Outta Compton, the movie, was very popular in the box office, and also The Weeknd's Can't Feel My Face was topping the Billboard Hot 100. And WebAssembly Project had been in development for about four months. <laughs> this isn't actually relevant to anything. I just want to get you in the mindset of where we were at, <laughs> you know? Okay. So, Ben Titzer, one of the WebAssembly creators, had been working on a, a prototype in V8 of, Web, of WebAssembly, uh, the Chrome's JavaScript engine. And at the same time, Andreas Rosberg had recently started working on a WebAssembly spec prototype in OCaml called ML Proto. Uh, if you've seen the text formats, and I think a lot of you have, you might see that this looks a little bit different. This is the way it was originally written. But you can actually see that it's very similar. Still S expressions. Uh, just like Lisp, we chose S expressions because we didn't really want to commit to a text format. We were like, well, we'll solve that problem later. Um, five years later, we still have not solved that problem. <laughs> and, and then Ben had been experimenting with a binary format. Now, I doubt any of you, well, actually, you probably can read this, but yeah, this is different too. <laughs> this is different too. So the formats were different, but actually a lot of the structure was the same. The one thing that we didn't have, though, was we didn't have a way to convert between the text format that Andreas was producing and the binary format that uh, Ben was consuming. Now, we could have added this, but we weren't really sure what we wanted to use yet, so we wanted to sort of um, have a tool that could do it. So, Ben asked anyone in a meeting, this is what I've been told, I can't remember it, it's a little fuzzy, but um, can anyone write a tool to do this? And um, actually, I hadn't been working on WebAssembly at all at that point. So naturally, I said, yes, of course, I can do this. Uh, I really had no idea how much work it would take, and so I thought, well, how hard could it be? Two weeks, right? <laughs> I took this sort of rule that my col uh, actually high school uh, computer science teacher told me, which is you take your estimate, which I was like, it'll take a day, and then you double it, and then you, you know, increment the time unit, right? So two weeks. <laughs> so <laughs> I told... I told him this, yeah, I can do it in two weeks. And uh, Nick Bray, who was a, a colleague uh, of mine at the time, uh, who'd been working on his own text format conversion to the binary format, said, no, there's no way. It's not gonna take that. And I said, it's a bet. <laughs> I don't know what kind of keyword that is, by the way. It's a, um, so yeah, in my hubris, I said, yeah, of course I can do it in two weeks. Why not? So and of course, at that point, I had to buckle down and do it. And actually, I started working on it and I got obsessed. I don't know, I mean, I'm sure you've all experienced this, but this feeling of just like working on something and you just work all the time. So this is actually a graph of the commits uh, to the repo, uh, the times that I did a commit. So you can sort of see my emotional state over the course of the day. This is maybe telling you a little bit too much about myself. <laughs> um, and yes, there are multiple commits at 4 a.m. Uh, I'm not proud of that, but you know, this was 2015, it was a wild time. <laughs> um, also, I like that there's this like, 3 p.m. is like this sweet spot for me. I don't know what it is. Something about that time is just like, you know, like the energy from the food from lunch is just like coursing, it's just going through. So um, this is the first two weeks of sex per wasm. I called it sex per wasm because I'm bad at naming things. And because, in a way, it actually makes sense, right? S expressions to WebAssembly, sex per WASM. So that's what I made. Um, so this is the uh, git commits for the first two weeks of sex per WASM. So um, you can see this second day, 
I was just like, yeah, let's just crank out this code. Just crank it out. So there's the lexer, there's the parser, uh, there's the binary writer, uh, there's the refactor, and then I started testing in the V8 native prototype. This is the, the um, tool that Ben was working on. And I really like this chart actually because it tells a story, right? So one thing that I thought was really interesting about this, and of course, you know, it's commits, so whatever. It's like, it's kind of fake statistics, but you know, that's what this is all about. So one thing that's interesting is it alternates, right? See that I have these like great days where I commit a lot, and then the next day I'm like, nah. And then a great day, and then a nah. And then great, and nah, great, nah. I just thought that was so interesting. Like, honestly, look at your repos. For this, I think you could probably find interesting patterns. And then another thing that's really interesting thing, uh, here is you can actually see it starts off real high and then it slopes down and then I get close to this deadline and I'm like, oh, I gotta do this. And then I, and then I like push through, right? Oh, so fun. Okay, well anyway. Um, so end of the two weeks, I finished. I wanna brag about my success. I mean, I did it, right? Two weeks, got it done. Ready to use. I even had it testing, uh, you know, I read a test runner on the second day. I was just like, yeah, this is, I'm, you know, 10x programmer right here. <laughs> no, not really. Uh, so, interesting thing here, actually, ML Proto became the WebAssembly reference interpreter. It's true. And then V8 Native Prototype, the binary format there, was basically the basis for the binary format that we use now. It's actually very similar. It still had sections, it still had uh, you know, code. It was a little different. There was no header, but it was very similar. So it was kind of awesome to be around at this time because it was like, you just sort of do something and it's like, yeah, okay, this is what we'll do. You know? um, there was a lot of argument. I, I don't know. I, let me, <laughs> let me take a step back and say that like, I was on the fringes at this point, so I'm sure the people uh, like Andreas in the room will be like, no, it was, it was much harder than this. But for me, this was like amazing. But so the one thing I wanna say about this is, I actually didn't win the bet. You know, I think I win the bet. But actually, sex for wasm got renamed to sex for wasm prototype because they're like, oh, this is a useful tool. And then it got renamed to Wabbit. And you probably have seen Wabbit. I've been working on it for the past five years. Uh, so, in a way I won the bet, in a way I lost the bet, in a way I also won the bet because now I'm here talking to you about it. So I don't know, it's, um, it's an interesting situation. But the reason I'm telling this story is, well, partially because it's a fun story to uh, start the talk with, but also because if you came to me and asked me, hey, could you work on this thing for the next five years? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd have to think about it at very least, right? But when it's presented as a small, concrete task, it's much easier to start on it and keep momentum, just sort of keep it going, right? And you can sort of see, like, you know, I didn't necessarily keep momentum, and actually the graph is a little bit fake here. You see how it goes from September 2019 to January 2020? There was zero commits, zero commits, and that happens. Um, so WebAssembly started in a very similar way, right? Very, very humble goals. Um, Here's the original list of the, uh, from the WebAssembly design repo, uh, checked in by Luke. I'm sure some of you uh, have chatted with Luke. Um, not a lot of this changed, even by the time we shipped uh, the MVP. But I wanna call out a few parts because there's a lot of text here. Um, the first thing is, WebAssembly is meant to serve as a web compilation target. That was like goal number one, right? Then goal number four, it's basically what you can do with Was uh, Asm.js, right? This is a pretty humble goal. Like, if you're developing a new VM and you say, we're just gonna do the same thing you can already do, that's kind of like, I don't know, wimping out maybe, you know? It's like, let's try and do something more. But I think we were, we were onto something here we realized that actually doing something small was the way to actually get people on board. And then the last thing here is we knew we wanted non-browser environments, but you see how it says design to allow, <laughs> right? We weren't planning on actually doing any of that yet. We just were sort of like, well, let's make sure that we don't like paint ourselves into a corner. And that's, I think, another really important part about the WebAssembly story. So the thing we started off with is basically this story right here. We start, with C++, we produce a WebAssembly file, then WebAssembly talks to JavaScript inside your web browser, and that's it, right? It's a pretty simple story, and it's, it, 
even simpler story when we talk about it from the perspective of this is already what ASM.js could do. But we wanted to start with something new because then we could sort of grow it without having to have JavaScript attached in that way. Right? So the, the steps here are the C++ compiler produces the WebAssembly file, step one. Then web, web browser loads that WebAssembly file, that's step two. The web, WASM module can only communicate with JavaScript. Remember, we didn't even want to allow WebAssembly to talk to other parts of the web, web APIs, right? Because it was kind of a complicated problem to solve. So um, instead we said, well, okay, JavaScript will do all the speaking for us. You know? And then internally, the WASM module can't actually do anything interesting. All it can do is sort of play around with numbers and memory. But actually that was still enough, right? So very, very humble goals. All right, so I spent some time trying to come up with the best acronym I could, and here's the one I got, API. Right? But it actually sort of loops in eventually. Okay. So um, A is the ability. What can WASM do? Right? That's one place we can grow WASM. What can WASM accomplish? Then um, P, producer. Who can make WASM? Right? We're starting off with C. And then uh, I, interop. Who can WASM talk to? In this case, just JavaScript. Right? And then uh, E, embedder. Who, uh, what can use WASM? In this case, just the web browser. Okay. All right, so this seems silly, but the reason I called this talk expanding the pie, there's this thing in negotiation, um, this term, I guess, called expanding the pie. It's based on the idea about how you would divide up a pie. Like, you, you both want pie, let's assume, and, um, but I want more pie, right? So, if I want more pie, does that mean that you get less pie? Well, yes, if the pie stays the same size. Okay, so now we're gonna step outside the rounds of, of reality and say, what if we make the pie bigger? Now, the percentage of the pie is the same, but I got more pie and you got more pie. It's sort of a win-win. So this idea of expanding the pie. Okay, so I, I sort of forced this because of the A pie thing. It all sort of came from that. But, but I think this is actually um, important to think about with WebAssembly, right? Because what we uh, originally had was a very s small pie. And there's not really anyone we're fighting with exactly, but let's sort of say we sort of have a very s humble set of goals. But what I think is an interesting part about WebAssembly is sort of figuring out where we can expand the reach of WebAssembly, expanding the pie. Okay, so let's move forward to March 2017. Get Out was at the top of the box office, around there. And uh, Ed Sheeran's song, Shape of You, you know that one? Was, uh, t <laughs> yeah, okay, we got some fans. Um, was topping Billboard Hot 100. Okay, and uh, WebAssembly had actually reached what we call the uh, browser consensus. Uh, this is a picture from uh, Lynn Clark. Uh, as you can tell because of the awesome style. Um, there's a few things I wanna call out here. Um, first of all, we had four browsers in two years working on this. It was like, people were like, how did you do this? How is this, how is this even possible? Um, and then uh, the second part here is that we basically decided that we were done with the MVP. Future features uh, would have to have backwards compatibility, right? We weren't gonna just start, keep making changes. We said, okay, anytime we add a new feature, we have to decide how we're gonna make it work with what we currently have. So, let's look at the proposals that we started with in November 2017, right? And so what I did was I tried to group all the proposals into this API uh, list here, right? So abilities are like the things that you can do, Producers are sort of like, let's look at it as ways to make it easier to produce WebAssembly, right? Ways to make it better to produce WebAssembly for that, for a particular language or environment. And then interop is ways that we can communicate, and then embedder is like, who can actually use WebAssembly? So you'll see that there, the ability column is really big. This is sort of originally how we thought about WebAssembly. We're like, well, we're making sort of like a CPU. We, we called it like a virtual ISA, right? Um, and so we wanted to add all the things that an ISA would have, right? Oh, we need threads, and we need SIMD, and we need exceptions, and of course these things are great, and the last talk shows this, right? But 
we didn't really, I mean, we had ideas about the rest of those parts, producers, interop, and embedders, but it's a more complicated question. Like, how do you make things better? It's like you have to work with other people. You can't just sort of like build up your, it's sort of like lifting weights, you know? You're like, oh, we're just gonna lift weights over here, but you know, you gotta talk to people too, right? Um, I don't know, I don't lift weights, but I think that metaphor sounds right. Um, okay, so yeah, the notable exceptions here that I'm calling out are garbage collection and host bindings. I think even from the beginning, we knew that these things we, we wanted. In fact, in the original future features list, uh, we actually combined these things. We called it GC slash DOM integration because we knew that this was one of the most important things we wanted to do. How do you talk to the web APIs? So in MVP WASM, we already can create a garbage collector. You've probably seen this, right? Um, if you've used um, some of the garbage collected languages. The way they do it is you have linear memory and you have your object layout and so these numbers are sort of representing addresses or something, right? And then the arrows are representing, you know, pointing from one reference to another. And then you can see uh, the, this pink garbage is, uh, you know, no one's pointing to it, and so we say, well, it's not needed, and so we can throw it in the dustbin, right? But there's a lot of problems with this. The first problem is um, you have to write your own garbage collector, right? So you have to put it inside your WebAssembly, and you have to sort of do it that way. But the second problem is that now anything that cares about the garbage collector has to live in this linear memory, right? So normally when you're running, um, a, an environment where you're, you're writing a garbage collector, this is a normal thing you would do, right? Like if you're making it an x86 or something. But you can actually read your local variables. You can look at the stack. But here we can't do that because WebAssembly has the separation between the local variables that you have and the linear memory. And that's for security reasons. It's actually a very, very important property of WebAssembly. So now what it means is that if you want to write your own garbage collector, you have to sort of spill everything into linear memory and it's not great, right? But there's another bigger problem, which is that now how do you talk to the embedder, right? I have my garbage collector that lives inside linear memory, and then I have my garbage collector that lives inside the embedder, like in your web browser, right? The JavaScript engine has a garbage collector, the DOM has a garbage collector. How do they talk to each other? And this is tricky. I mean, garbage collectors notoriously sort of want to control everything. Right? And there's ways to make them work together, and I'm certainly not an expert in it, and I'm sure the experts will tell me that I'm wrong about something, but that's fine. Um, anyway, so this is sort of an open question. Like, how do we, how do we make garbage collectors work between these environments um, if that's what we want to do? A better solution would be to just say, let's use the embedder's garbage collector. Right? Don't make our own garbage collector in linear memory. Let's just share the one that already exists. We're assuming that it exists. So we'll talk about that later. later. Um, first, let's talk about the uh, other part in 2017, host bindings. Okay, so host bindings is sort of this idea, right? Right now, like I said, uh, JavaScript speaks for WebAssembly, right? Speaks on behalf of WebAssembly. You say, JavaScript, please do this thing, and then JavaScript says, okay, Web, uh, web APIs, please do this thing, and then it comes back and, and gives you the results. But there's inefficiencies there. Right? We don't necessarily want to have to go through JavaScript. It's just like if you're playing telephone. So the idea with host bindings originally sort of was, you know, we'd have this magic in the center, host bindings. And then it would take these numbers and somehow convert them to dictionaries and DOM strings. Um, and actually, that's kind of what interface types is, but, you know, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, but this basic idea was, was there from, from almost the beginning. Um, yes, let's move on. Okay, jumping forward, June 2018, Ocean's 8, very popular movie, topping the box office. And then, of course, This is America by Childish Gambino. Very popular song as well. I really like the way this one turned out. I like the posterizing on it. Anyway, moving on. Okay, so meanwhile, looking at the proposals that we have, we're starting to see some new things happen here, right? We see garbage collection is, is developing a little bit more, and we have a new thing that's called reference types. I'll talk about that in a sec. And then we also have WASM C API. So now this is the first place where we're starting to think about the embedder, other places that we can run WebAssembly. Right? Okay. 
All right, so let's talk about the GC proposal at this point in time. This is sort of like a big wall of text. I color coded some things so you can sort of see the uh, sort of see where everything lines up. And you know, I sort of made some some quick little fixes and stuff. But this is sort of like the high level, right? We have some new types. There's references. We have new type definitions. So we can define things like structs and arrays and, and packed fields. And then we have some subtyping. So this was sort of the, the design around two, uh, 2018. And we figured this would be sort of a nice basis for building a lot of garbage collected languages on top of, but we weren't sure um, we needed to work with other you know, people who were making programming language to try and determine if this was correct. But you, know, you have to start somewhere, and this seemed like a reasonable place to start. But let's talk about reference types. Oh, what, was, what, was, what was so funny? <laughs> um, OK, so let's talk about reference types. Um, what's interesting about reference types is that actually part of the thing that we wanted from, from garbage collection, we didn't actually need, right? When we talked about DOM integration, all we really wanted to do is we'd come up with a way to say, I have references to something that the embedder gave me. Garbage collection, in a way, is about saying, let me create my own objects. Let me be sort of master of creating objects. But we don't really need that. If we just have a way for WebAssembly to say, well, I understand what you're giving me, right? Hold a reference to somebody else's objects. Then actually gets you a lot. And so the two things that reference types adds is this idea of any ref, which is you can reference uh, any ref references anything. It's the top type, right? Top type meaning sort of it can, it, it's a super type of everything. It's kind of like Java's object. Hopefully that's right. Um, and then there's func ref, which is the super type of all functions. And then we also sort of decided, well, any ref, any ref because it can reference any function, uh, any object can also reference any function. So any ref, then func ref, and then et cetera, right? And this actually gets you a decent amount. Right? We can basically point at a bunch of different objects and we can keep track of them inside WebAssembly and we can do a lot with just this. So this was something that came out of um, 2018, sort of split out of GC because we wanted to try and move it forward more quickly because GC was complicated and it still kind of is. Um, but this seemed more concrete and we could, we could solve this problem. Um, and actually, I, I kind of want to make a point about this. This is another sort of idea of the incrementalism that we've been sort of trying to promote with WebAssembly. <laughs> when there's a complicated problem, don't solve it yet. Try and figure out the piece that's still useful, that's easier to solve, and then we can sort of move forward there. And we've done that a few times. Um, so another thing that happened in 2018 was the WASM C API. So this is the thing that I was talking about before, the embedders. How do we take WebAssembly, which right now, or at the time, was maybe mostly only useful for the web browser, and make it so that it's useful for somebody else, like a C++ application, or maybe uh, running in a server somewhere? And so taking uh, a VM and creating a standard interface so that any VM that implements this interface could just be swappable. You could, an application could choose to use any of them, interpreters, AOTs, JITs, whatever you need to be able to support your system. Uh, so what I'm showing here is the C++ API, but there's also a C API. And the idea is that you know, these are common enough that people should be able to uh, use them for a lot of applications. Okay, so that was 2018. And yeah, this is not exactly the Hello World app. I sort of rewrote it. It's, it's Slideware. It, maybe it compiles. I don't know. Um, all right. So let's move forward to August 2019. This was just, what, six months ago? Lion King was a little bit of a flop. OK. Uh, but then also Old Town Road. Ah, you remember that song? Yes, you all remember that song, of course. Very popular at that time. All right, so then we have a new explosion from the garbage collection proposal. So first we see type imports, typed function references, but now we get host bindings being renamed to interface types and we get a new thing called WASI. So now we're starting to see much more effort being pushed towards interoperability. And I think what's, what I found really great 
hearing um, actually the voting and uh, some of the talks earlier is that interoperability is actually in a way one of the most important things to a lot of the people here. Um, and I think, I don't know, I, I don't know if I would have been able to guess that um, six months ago. So, uh, but clearly somebody else did because that's why we're seeing all of this stuff. Okay, so let's type, talk about type function references. Um, so this is actually just an extension on top of the reference types proposal. Reference types has any type and func, um, uh, sorry, uh, of and func ref, any any ref and func ref, and now we can say, well, instead of saying func ref, which represents all functions, what if we just have individual function signatures and you can create a reference to those? Now there are other things that fall out, fall out from that, but that's the basic idea. It doesn't actually change the functionality that's provided. It just changes the type system inside WebAssembly, and what that means is that now we can do things like. If you want to call a function, before you had to say, just like imagine you had a Java function and the signature was object, 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 and it returns an object, right? The way you would have to make that work is you would have to look at all those objects and say, well, is this the object I expected? Yes, okay. Is this the object I expected? Yes, okay. And you can determine at that point that it's safe to make that call. But with a typed function signature, you can say, well, WebAssembly's type system is sound, therefore we know we don't have to make those checks. At least that's the idea. So we extend it in this way. Then typed imports basically provides the same thing. It's a similar idea, right? We had any ref which said this can reference any object, but now what if we said, well, what if we only want to reference this type? What if we only want to reference this type? And then we introduce subtypes like you've probably seen in your object-oriented classes, motorcycles, cars, and vans, triangles, squares, and circles. I don't know if these are still good ideas for object hierarchies, but you know, it's good enough for slideware. Um, and the idea is that you can introduce some subtyping relationships and uh, provide references in that same way. But ultimately, it doesn't actually change the functionality, it just makes the, the system more sound, and then also means that you don't have to do as many checks. That's the idea. If you haven't read uh, interface types, I, I assume basically everybody's read this, right? No? Lynn Clark's interface types? Okay. If you haven't, you should read this one because it's really great. It goes into a lot more detail than I can talk about here and I want to talk about here because, you know, there's only so much time. Um, but at a high level, uh, let's talk about the motivation of interface types. It's the same as host bindings, but there are three things that we call out here that I think are actually pretty interesting. Uh, first off is optimizing calls to web APIs. Again, very, very important for interoperability. Um, the next one is shared nothing linking. So shared nothing linking is this idea of saying, I've got a module and I've got another module. I don't want these modules to be able to mess with each other, right? You don't want somebody to, to come over into your house and start, you know, dirtying up your dishes or whatever, right? You just hand things off and then at the, you know, at the front door and then, you know, okay, I'll solve your problem and then you hand the result back. And so this idea of shared nothing is sort of like, you know, I've got my space and you've got your space and let's just keep it that way. And this is actually very important for security. So Lynn talked about this in her keynote. Right, We need to start thinking more carefully with a lot of the software we write about how to handle the security aspects of it. And so that's, I think that's a really important one here that interface types helps enable. And then the last one here is defining language neutral interfaces like WASI. Okay. Um, yeah, so WASI, again, a really great intro by Lynn. So you should read that if you haven't read it. Um, but I just want to call out a couple of things here. Um, the idea about WASI is again, interop. How do we communicate with the outside world in a sandboxed capability-based API design? The idea is that we're, we're trying to come up with ways to make it so that we can work better with the outside world, but we don't necessarily contaminate our understanding of our universe. Um, and then the next part here is, again, allowing the overall API to evolve over time. So what's great about 
this document is that it actually mirrors the original WebAssembly high-level goals. And I think this is really important. These are actually pretty, I mean, this is a, this is a little bit harder. It's, it's not as humble a goal. There, but there is some prior art that was leveraged for WASI that we could look at, things like um, libpreopen and uh, other o OCAP designs. So I think that's really a great thing about WebAssembly, uh, WASI here. Okay, let's fast forward to the present day. Where are we? Um, well, uh, <laughs> let's move on. Uh, okay, let's start with GC. So, uh, reference types, which I've sort of argued is maybe one of the most important parts of this so far, is currently stage uh, phase three. Um, maybe tomorrow will become phase four, which means that it's very, very close to becoming a standard, which is great. Um, the GC proposal itself now has some competition. There are some uh, academic researchers uh, in this group called the Single Open Intermediate Language or SOIL Initiative um, who have some of their own ideas about uh, how this proposal can go forward. And if you're interested in talking about such things, I think it will happen tomorrow, the community group meeting. And if you're not so interested, you can read the notes. And if you're really not interested, why are you here? <laughs> All right, so then today, uh, the WASM C API is actually implemented in three places. It's implemented in V8 natively, both C and C++. Um, it's implemented in Wabbit, thanks to uh, Sam Clegg, and it's implemented in WASM time, uh, apparently. Uh, so just a start of where we can start to see this grow. Um, and WASI is moving forward. Actually, one great thing about WASI is that it's got its own sort of meetings, its own cadence. A lot of the things that have uh, sort of started in WebAssembly have spun out. They have their own groups and they have their own organization. And so if you're only interested in WASI, you can just go to WASI, right? And so um, this is one thing that I thought was actually pretty interesting about the WASI um, design currently is that they have this format called WIDX which allows you to sort of specify programmatically in a format that looks very similar to WAT, um, the API surface that you would be using to communicate with the operating system. So these are some interesting new developments that are happening here um, and tools to be able to process this too, which is very cool. Uh, interface types, uh, there's a lot of text here. So I don't know, take a picture and look at it later or read the explainer. Um, but the point I sort of want to get across here is that we're starting to flesh out a lot of the details about how this, how this worked. Remember how it was a cloud at the beginning, this host bindings, how is it all going to work? Well, we're getting much closer. And like uh, WASI, it has its own uh, meetings. Um, there's actually one, what day is it today? Okay, well, three days. Um, talking about how this was gonna move forward, how we can create these interface adapters, how we can join them together, what the spec will look like. So if you're interested in this stuff, join in. Okay, but remember, the point of all of this stuff, all of the stuff that we're talking about, it's very easy to look at the low level individual proposals just like Ashley was saying, remember the Vasa, right? All these individual things that come together into this like behemoth. But the goal, I think, is a pie. Oh, come on. Yes, a pie. <laughs> Expand the pie. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, that's all I've got. Um, if you're interested in joining the community group, there's a link at the top. Uh, there's lots of great stuff. If you're interested in proposing something, that's the place to start. Um, meetings, that's where we talk about all the phase documents. That's where we uh, put all our meeting notes. Uh, you can see what meetings are happening, uh, like the one happening tomorrow for two days. Um, the proposals, if you want to look at any of the proposals I talked about, that's where you can find them. And of course, uh, Lynn's excellent cartoons, you can find them here. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.